And now allow me to get our online, our online audience ready for the next session. Uh, this is the time in which we click on to session three, reinvent innovation and future of energy. This is presented by Shell, ladies and gentlemen. Now to start things off for this session, a keynote address, and this will be delivered by Her Excellency Damilola Agunbi, Chief Executive Officer and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General, Co-Chair of UN Energy, Sustainable Energy for All, to deliver her address. Here she is. Thank you for having me at the Singaporean International Energy Week 2021. I'm delighted to be speaking to you all, and I want to thank and commend the Singapore Energy Market Authority for organizing this important event. The recent IPCC report has clearly indicated that the world is already experiencing the dire consequences of a business as usual approach to climate change. Current commitments from governments are not ambitious enough to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And COVID-19 has widened this gap and highlighted the urgency for delivering energy access to all by 2030. The transition towards a clean, just and equitable energy future hinges on innovation in technologies, policies, and market mechanisms. Disruptive technology, along with the right mix of innovation, business models, and policies have already played a crucial role in accelerating the clean energy transition. With increased digitalization, we have an opportunity to rethink restructure and reinvent how energy is supplied and consumed in a sustainable manner. Innovation is critical to accelerating the adoption of renewable energy for energy access and energy efficiency for buildings, industries, and transportation. It is more urgently needed for 759 million people around the world who have no access to electricity and for 2.6 billion people who have no access to clean cooking solutions. And for over a billion people who do not have access to cooling for healthcare, food security and productivity. Achieving Sustainable Development Goal 7 is the cornerstone of net zero pathways and a just transition. In September, the UN Secretary General convened the High Level Dialogue on Energy, where government, private sector, development institutions, and civil society showcased their leadership and renewed commitments toward sustainable energy and net zero trajectory through what we know as energy compacts. As of now, we have more than 160 energy compacts that have been submitted from national and local governments, businesses, foundations, and civil society and youth organizations for every region across the world. The clean energy funding in new finance and investment commitments by national governments and the private sector seen in these compacts amount to over 400 billion for access and energy transition, out of which more than 90% of these commitments were done by the private sector, signaling the important role the private sector will play in the clean energy transition. This is just a start, and there is a need to rapidly scale similar ambitions and actions. As I speak, the global community is getting ready to meet at COP26 in Glasgow to raise and accelerate the global climate action agenda. What we do today will determine the future for people and planet. I invite you all to develop your own ambitious, innovative and action oriented energy compacts to create global momentum in the important decade of action. Once again, I would like to congratulate Singapore International Energy Week for creating an excellent platform and network to share information, experiences, 
as the world works to recover better. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Her Excellency. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to the next keynote address. And this, of course, will be on the subject of reinvent innovation and future of energy. Delivering this will be the Honorable Angus Taylor MP, Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction in Australia. Here we are. Mr. Yong and fellow energy ministers, I'm pleased to join you for another Singapore International Energy Week. And I thank the Government of Singapore for the opportunity to address you today. It's great to see the Australia-Singapore relationship going from strength to strength. This open exchange of ideas adds to the robustness of our relationship. I can't overemphasise the importance of innovation for our energy future. It's a theme that resonates with us here in Australia as we take a technology-led approach to reducing emissions. Australia is committed to achieving net zero emissions and has developed a plan to do that by 2050. We're also committed to working with our international partners in our region and globally to accelerate the solutions that will make net zero practically achievable for all. So often in this debate, the focus is too narrow. This is a global problem and we all have a role to play in addressing it. Now in its latest World Energy Outlook, the International Energy Agency was emphatic that the energy sector has to be at the heart of the solution to climate change. Australia agrees. As the world moves into a new energy era, a technology-led approach is the only way we can maintain energy security in our region and, at the same time, drive economic growth. Australia is the world's fourth largest energy exporter, and we have abundant resources across traditional, transitional and new energy resources. And our customer countries in Asia rely on us to meet much of their energy needs. Our technology not taxes approach will allow us to reduce our emissions without damaging our reliability as an energy supplier and the thousands of jobs that depend on those exports. We've already seen renewable energy technologies deliver extraordinary reductions in costs in our electricity sector. Growth in renewable energy, such as household solar and wind in Australia, has been so rapid, we expect renewables to supply more than half of our electricity within a decade. We're determined to repeat this success using technologies that can reduce or offset emissions in sectors like agriculture, mining and manufacturing. But the technology solutions need to cut, needed to cut emissions from these sectors are either expensive to deploy or are still in the R&D stage. They include clean hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, electricity storage, soil carbon and low emissions materials like steel and aluminium. These are priority technologies for the Australian Government under our Technology Investment Roadmap. By making them cheaper and more economically productive than existing approaches, we can reduce our emissions and support some of Australia's major trading partners to decarbonise. Implementation of the Roadmap is on track with our government making significant investments to help meet targets to cut, cut the cost of key technologies. For example, our goal is to achieve production cost of under $2 Australian per kilogram for clean hydrogen and under $20 per tonne of carbon capture and storage. At these thresholds, these technology solutions will be economically competitive with traditional alternatives and attractive to investors. This is key to widespread global adoption because countries won't have to choose between growth and decarbonisation. It's key to the inclusive energy transition that Singapore places such a, an emphasis on. To achieve our targets, the Australian government is investing more than $20 billion over this decade to deploy low emissions technologies. We expect this investment to leverage at least $80 billion of public and private investment by 2030 and create more than 160,000 jobs. International collaboration is vital for speeding up deployment of low emissions technologies and building strong and efficient global energy supply chains that will make net zero possible. This year alone, Australia has committed over $565 million to back international partnerships on low emissions technologies including 60 million to build a high integrity carbon offset scheme in our region. Australia is proud to be working in partnership with Singapore and other international partners such as Japan, Korea, Germany and the UK 
to deploy low emissions technologies. We've already built some of the world's largest and most successful energy, energy supply chains into Asia. And this provides a foundation for building supply chains for low emissions technologies. I'm pleased Australia and Singapore are progressing implementation of our MOU signed exactly a year ago to advance cooperation on low emissions technologies and solutions. Last week, we saw a great sense of purpose and collegiate spirit at the first annual dialogue of officials, signaling a shared commitment to deliver results under our MOU. I'm also pleased we've committed to a $30 million partnership that will accelerate the deployment of and create new markets for low emissions fuels and technologies like clean hydrogen to reduce emissions in maritime and port operations. The MOU demonstrates our shared commitment to drive practical solutions to climate change. Building on the success, I'm pleased to note that negotiations have commenced on a Singapore-Australia Green Economy Agreement. This agreement supports the goals of the MOU and will promote trade, investment and jobs in clean growth sectors for our two nations and boost our growing bilateral energy partnership. I look forward to continuing to work with Minister Yong and energy ministers in the region to pursue practical pathways to a net zero future that allows our region to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Up next, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Chang Si Kang, President, Member of the Board, State Grid Corporation of China, with his keynote address. Good afternoon from Beijing and uh, ladies and gentlemen. 中在第七十五届联合国大会上，中国国家主席习近平提出，二氧化碳的排放力争要于二零三零年前达成峰值，努力争取二零六零年前实现碳中和的目标。这是对构建人类命运共同体的庄严承诺。The last year, the Chinese President Xi Jinping announced to the world of China's 2030 and 2060 anti-climate ambition in the. 75th-UN-Sample。国家电网公司以赋能美好生活推动能源革命为起点,为超过10亿人口提供电力服务。借此机会呢,我就推动数字化转型,赋能低碳创新发展,与大家分享两个方面的认识和探索。State Grid Corporation of China is providing power supply to 1.1 billion NZ population in China and is committed to powering the uh, beautiful life and energy transition. Today, I will share some learnings and best practice and in digitalization and low-carbon innovation. The创新发展是实现能源低碳转型的重要出路。创新发展推动能源电力从高碳到低碳。从以化石能源为主向以清源能源为主转变。是应对气候变化。First, the innovation is the key solution to energy transition. We are facing a transition in from the high carbon to the low carbon, and from the fossil fuels and to the clean energy, and which is the way towards the sustainable development addressing the climate change. In the innovation side, the 我们公司呢，发布了碳达峰、碳中和的行动方案，提出要当好引领者、推动者、先行者的发展定位。一是充分发挥电网的桥梁和纽带作用，带动产业链供应链上下游实现能源生产清洁化、能源消费电气化、能
and clean production promote the innovations in technology, policy, mechanism, and models aiming for the carbon neutrality. 在电网转型方面, 我们公司制定了构建以新能源为主体的新型电力系统的行动方案，提出公司发展方式上要从传统的电网企业向能源互联网企业转移，积极培育新业务、新业态和新模式，延伸产业链和价值。在电网发展方式上，我们要从以大电
，为共同打造天蓝、地绿、水清的美好地球家园不懈努力。最后呢，预祝本次峰会圆满成功，谢谢大家。Ladies and gentlemen, Stegra is ready to work with you to drive the energy transition, innovations, and digitalization, and to make our planet a better place to live. Last but not least, and wish this summit a great success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhang Zikang. Thank you very much. We now move on to a panel, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, I'm going to be inviting our panelists up on stage right now. We firstly have Ms. Tan Sushan, Managing Director, Group Head of Institutional Banking, DBS Group. Mr. Chris Ong, Chief Executive Officer, Keppel Offshore and Marine. Mr. Sumant Sinha, Founder, Chairman and CEO, Renew Power. Mr. Akihiro Fukuda, Chairman, Sunoco Energy. And ladies and gentlemen, moderating this session will be the general manager, City Solutions Renewables and Energy Solutions Shell, Miss Emily Tan, who's just on my right, right here. Emily, do enjoy the session. We'll leave the floor to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure and privilege to be moderating this session with my esteemed panelists. Throughout the theme of today's conference, we've talked about accelerating the energy transition, and innovation is absolutely central to that. And innovation is not just about technology, it's also about innovating business models as well as financing models to, sell, to help accelerate the energy transition. So let's first talk about technology innovation. I'll first like to ask our panelist, Chris. Um, Capital O&M has been pivoting towards gas and renewables in the last few years, and you've been harnessing digital technologies as an enabler. Tell us more about your experience. Um, thanks, Emily, first uh, for having me here, and uh, that's a good question. I think uh, technology and digitization actually is um, vital. Actually, it's part of our and in line with our strategy when we try to pivot away from. Uh, oil products into a cleaner uh, products and also renewables. Let's take for example, we, when we take a look at uh, technology, we take a look at both our operation uh, optimization and also the assets that we are creating for our customer worldwide, uh, whether it's in LNG or whether it is for renewables. Um, for our operation um, optimization, um, we, in the plant by itself, we also need to optimize our energy usage, right? Uh, so we have actually installed about 21,000 solar panels on rooftop. That would be about um, 9 megawatt peak uh, for us. Um, and on top of that, we are also involved with EMA to trial uh, battery storage. And on top of that, we have replaced some of the um, diesel generators with uh, frequency converters. So um, with digitization, we actually put in smart meters. And uh, with that, we actually are able to have visibility and also some kind of mindset change towards how do we use uh, energy more efficiently. So in the lack of you know, a green electron at this moment, we are actually looking at optimizing uh, how do we use uh, energy. Now for our assets, um, we have our own suite and franchise of uh, designs that we supply uh, to customers worldwide. You know? So the, the market is actually worldwide. So um, take for example, um, when we uh, do a circular economy project, we bring in an asset that is uh, 30, 40 years old, convert it and give it a new lease of life. Uh, in fact, new capabilities, more capable for the uh, cleaner energy. Actually, at the end of the day, we are actually digitizing the, the asset itself for our customers. And of course, for new products, we will put in all the uh, digitization tools that uh, we are able to have the capabilities to actually uh, monitor these assets in Singapore. So in that way, we are also helping our customers to actually take a look at the energy efficiency too. So in that way, I think the technology uh, digitization and also uh, IPs around uh, energy transition is uh, part and puzzle of our transition. Oh, thank you for that. You're harnessing so many different digital technologies to help your customers and your own businesses. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on to India. And I see Suman has joined us. Hello. Hello, Suman. 
Hope you can hear us well. Um, India is, has, ambitious, has, has, has an ambition to really increase their clean energy capacity. Can you tell us what, in your view, are upcoming technologies that can help accelerate the decarbonisation of the India energy sector? Yeah, sure. Sorry uh, for my video quality uh, being not very good. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, but yeah, look, there are uh, one of the things that is happening in our sector is that there are some really massive changes that have been happening in technology. And uh, in fact, over the last uh, few years, we all know that the cost of renewables has gone down very dramatically as a result of significant uh, changes that have happened in both solar and wind. And uh, I think that is in some ways step one of what has happened. Uh, that is the most basic thing, uh, uh, an improvement. Uh, so that is, I think, a very big positive because that is showing us a clear pathway towards decarbonization of the electricity sector. So I think that is, uh, step, as I said, step one. Now the question is new opportunities are emerging. Uh, of course, storage is the first uh, new technology that is emerging, uh, which is allowing us to substantially reduce um, the intermittency factor of renewables and thereby actually improve its grid friendliness, which is really fundamental to uh, increasing the percentage of renewables uh, from 10% to 20 or 30 or even more than that in the future. So there's a lot of work, as you know, happening on the storage side. So that's in some ways technology number two. The third thing that is happening now, of course, is this whole issue around uh, uh, green hydrogen that is now becoming, uh, you know, it's, there's more conversation happening around it. And it does look like green hydrogen will become a very interesting pathway to move uh, renewables from electricity only into the more broader, uh, let's say, the molecules play or the play which is around uh, uh, mobility and uh, hard to abate sectors and so on. So the ability to get the cost of hydrogen to come down using um, renewables uh, and making it clean, I think that is going to be another huge big development that is going to happen in our sector over the next uh, few years' time. But it will take some time. Uh, in addition to that, there are a number of new areas that are opening up uh, digital was talked about earlier. That's going to be a very big area because that will allow us to improve the percentage of renewables in the grid. It will allow people to manage their, uh, their energy um, uh, requirements a lot better and it will improve the overall efficiency of the elect electricity systems as a whole. So I think that's another area that um, uh, will evolve and, and be quite useful. So I think, you know, let, let me stop here and just say that um, one of the exciting things in our sector is that it's growing rapidly and that there are now tremendous amounts of new technology innovations that are happening that will make, in fact, the sector even more attractive and interesting going forward. Thank you, Sumant. So digital technologies, energy storage and green hydrogen, we can see that technologies are evolving so rapidly and it makes it challenging somewhat for investors in technology to decide when is the right time to invest. So for that question, I would like to go to Aki. Mm -hmm. As an investor in two new technologies in your business, what are some of the concerns and challenges you face when you put resources into new technologies? Okay. Yes, Emily. Um, economic feasibility and uh, recovery period of the investment might be the two key concerns when we invest into uh, new technologies. If uh, we look at uh, Singapore, uh, experts have said that uh, hydrogen or uh, carbon capture could be the key technologies uh, to have the uh, uh, peak greenhouse gas uh, emission here in Singapore by uh, 2050. Now, if we look at uh, uh, hydrogen, that could be the answer to the, the Singapore's ambitious uh, energy ta uh, emission target. Uh, the energy market are expecting that uh, utility size, uh, hydrogen power generation, uh, uh, could become financially feasible by 2030, if not uh, 2035. Now, with Singapore's potential to be one of the leading hydrogen-powered country in the world, um, investors might be less inclined to make new investment today to a latest model of uh, gas turbine, um, in here in Singapore due to the short recovery period before a potential uh, implementation of uh, hydrogen uh, power generation in here. Uh, yet it is too early uh, today 
for a power generator to invest in uh, uh, hydrogen power plants because uh, of the lack of uh, 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 economic feasibility of hydrogen power today. So the issue is, what shall we do now? Until then, short time period. I understand that uh, uh, there are two uh, main pillars to consider. One is the sustainability of the existing energy-only market and the existing power generator. Uh, the existing generating companies needs to survive until, until then, until such date that the hydrogen power, uh, that technology achieve economic feasibility so that the existing generator themselves becomes the platform to convert the existing power units into hydrogen compatible infrastructure, switching from uh, uh, gas fuel to hydrogen fuel, switching from uh, existing gas turbine to hydrogen turbine. Uh, the other one is the sustainability of the newly invested renewable infrastructure. Um, new technologies in the renewable arena are so innovative that they often become obsolete or uh, less competitive in a short period of time. For example, um, new investment to implement an infrastructure uh, for the uh, renewable energy import. Uh, that is not recoverable within this short uh, 10 years time frame uh, at a competitive price setting. That investment needs much longer period for uh, a recovery of its return. Hence, ensuring a level playing field is essential to secure the economic sustainability of both the existing power generator and the newly invested renewable infrastructure. But for that, we need uh, invention, if you will, of, uh, in a regulatory and a financial framework um, in tandem with an invention of uh, uh, new technologies uh, to help mitigate the risk that the investor might, might face with the rapid devolution of the new technology. But yes, uh, we welcome a rapid devolution of new technologies to be greener or to be more competitive. However, the engagement and the contribution of an investor uh, should not be converted into just a bad luck when uh, its invested technology becomes obsolete or uh, less competitive in a short time frame. Okay. Thank you, Aki. You brought a very, very important point and that investors into new technology shouldn't be put into a disadvantaged situation because technologies are evolving so very quickly. And in fact, having a level playing field becomes really important. So innovation in terms of regulation and also financing framework becomes really, really critical. So then I'll move to Sushan, who is our financing expert here. Sushan, tell us a bit about how the banking sector is innovating in business models as well as financing models to help adoption of new technologies. Well, Emily, everything that we've heard today in Sioux suggests that the financing opportunity is massive. Uh, for those of us who, who read the IEA report in the last two weeks, uh, the suggestion is also, you know, you're looking at a $4 trillion uh, investment per annum for, for this pivot to happen. Um, at DBS, uh, I think we recognize, to, to, to Aki's point, that you can't transit from brown to green overnight, especially when you're toggling, you know, energy security, power security, along with very long-term investments, very long-tail investments in green renewable projects that can be not cost-effective uh, and not scalable in the short term or the medium term. So I think all these different um, supply and demand dynamics creates a very interesting confluence of supply and demand for financial innovation in this industry. Uh, you know, whether it's startup, so the pre, uh, you know, viable to fully viable uh, to, to later on. And the good news underpinning all this is that, guess what? There's a lot of capital going into, into the space, right? You read on Bloomberg, you know, ESG funds are now over 5 trillion or whatever this ESG bond funds are 54 billion. So the numbers are in the billions and the trillions. So there is enough 
supply of financial power going into investing, but it's how do you triangulate the risk, the returns uh, uh, amongst the, 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 the various stages of this innovation that we see. Um, so I talked about the transition uh, finance framework that we came up with. We recognize that you can't you know, pivot from brown to green overnight and that if each industry shows their glide path towards reducing their emissions, moving towards investing, then you know what? The market will reward you for that. So we've come up with these transition frameworks and products that will reward companies that embrace this transition. Uh, so issuing of sustainability bonds, green bonds, renewable bonds, you know, the, 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 the market's been, been it, it used to be that you had to give quite a nice sort of uh, discount to that. But nowadays, I think it's becoming more and more mainstream um, and, 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 and the discount is narrowing. Um, the other um, is also the fact that most companies are also trying very hard to pivot and investors want to pivot. Why do investors want to pivot? Um, I think two reasons. The first is you're seeing a massive uh, sea change in the transfer of wealth. Millennials are now coming into, into making those investment decisions and they want to see that the companies that they invest in have a green agenda and are here for good and here to do good. Um, and um, I guess that the last two innovations to talk about uh, could be also uh, the energy transition mechanism. Uh, we're seeing also a lot more public-private partnerships. I talked about the risk sharing, whether it's early stage, middle stage, late stage. I think the whole capital recycling mechanism has started. Um, and along the ETM theme, for example, I think multilaterals can play a bigger role mm -hmm. in maybe shortening uh, the life, life cycle or lifespan of some of these coal fire power plants. They could say, well, we'll offtake this at a lower IRR so that you can take them off the market sooner rather than later. That's one example of some financial innovation we're seeing. Um, and... And the other is, is, is also uh, the sustainability and renewable bonds, but also the asset recycling. As projects become sustainable and viable, then the project financiers can, can asset recycle them into the myriad number of infrastructure funds, utility funds that are looking for that stable return as a lot of these projects become utilities. Another innovation could be if it's sort of not quite tested yet, the governments can come in and say, look, I will be the off-taker, I will guarantee this off-take so that we can then uh, um, f viably finance structure a financial tool around this, whether it's geothermal, which we've done in Indonesia, with the government off-take, for example, very successful bond issuance, um, and that helped uh, uh, both the government and, and, and the company get the right kind of financing at the right price. So a lot going on in this space. It's everyone playing their role. It's everyone contributing um, and, 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 and innovating to, to get us to a greener future. Excellent. Thank you for that. It's really encouraging to hear that the financial sector is definitely innovating. To Very exciting. In this space. And you talk a lot about partnerships as well. So everyone coming in, playing their role, chipping in to help in the process. So indeed, I think a central theme that we've heard in today's conference is about collaboration, how we need different parties to come to the table together and work together. Um, so certainly in, in my work with cities as well, I find that pulling together government, industry and community to effect system level changes in low carbon solutions is absolutely critical. So I'd like to pose the question back to our panelists. What is your view of the role of uh, the private sector? And can you share some examples of successful collaboration that we can learn about and then try and replicate? Shall I start with, uh, I will start with uh, Sumant over in India. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Emily, for that question. And um, yeah, uh, as you can see, I'm a little bit more settled now. That's good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No, so, you know, um, absolutely to your question uh, of the role of the private sector, it is absolutely, absolutely critical because governments cannot solve this problem by themselves. Uh, this is something that requires um, all hands on deck and it requires uh, all corporates, uh, financial institutions, uh, the governments, uh, people at large, all to work together because the problem is massive and the solutions that have to be done at scale and they will have to be done uh, across the board. Now, the role of the private sector essentially is, one thing that I'm seeing is that financial markets are moving very rapidly. And the whole theme of, CA, of ESG investing is picking up dramatically. 
and that is already going to start putting pressure on corporates to start thinking about their uh, whole uh, role in uh, in uh, in moving forward on sustainability issues. So I think the financial sector is first off the blocks, not first off the blocks, but certainly is off the blocks at ma much more scale. The second thing is there are companies like ours, for example, that have become obviously companies that are setting up new capacities in renewable energy, that are working on technology solutions, that are coming out of business models. And uh, and so uh, so those kinds of companies will go forward. What we also need, essentially, is we need the large global oil and gas companies, because these are also large energy players who have large capital to stop investing in fossil fuel and start investing in clean energy systems. Now, I see that at the risk of creating more competition for myself, but I think in the sense of the fact that globally this is required. Okay, so I think we need that to happen as well. And then we need corporates who are also users of uh, or emitters of carbon, uh, users of energy, also to do their own work on trying to move towards uh, carbon-free solutions, especially in the hard to reach sectors. Uh, and there are four sectors that account for 80% of the, of the corporate sector's emissions. Those are uh, steel, cement, aluminum, and refining. If these four sectors get together and really focus on creating green industries, then that will also go a long way in bringing down carbon emissions. So I think it's not just as a creator of new renewable capacity, but also as a user of uh, things that emit carbon, where the corporate sector has a very important role to play. Now, in terms of your question about cooperation between the corporate sector and the government, uh, certainly that is critical because governments have to formulate policies. In a number of the countries, governments run the grid, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore they have to work very closely with the private sector in finding solutions. And this requires a lot of dialogue and discussion because you can't make policy in a vacuum. This requires a lot of conversation and it requires a degree of uh, openness, transparency and partnership. Uh, if uh, governments have the view that, you know, I don't want to talk to the private sector because, you know, they'll only have their own interests at heart, then it'll be harder for uh, for uh, this whole partnership to work. Now, in India, for example, the government is a very active uh, partner in moving forward on finding clean energy solutions. They've set a massive target of 450 gigawatts in India over the next uh, nine years, uh, which companies like ours have to execute on the ground. And because the large part of the power sector is still in the hands of various governments of India, state governments or central government, we have to really, really work very closely with them. And if we don't have good cooperation, that will never lead to a decarbonizing of the electricity sector and the energy sector at large. So, so we are working very closely with the government, and we are signing long-term PPAs with the government. We are working with them on, on coming out with new policies and so on. So there are a number of very broad measures and areas in which we are, as companies, participating in India, of course, but the same thing will apply to a number of other large developing countries and certainly the developed markets as well. So this partnership is very critical and the role of the corporate sector is very critical and I cannot overstress that. Right. Thank you, Sumant. Indeed, collaboration is absolutely key and we actually need a lot more collaboration than we have today. So to your point about oil and gas companies also need to invest into, into this, I felt I must also then chip in since I'm from an oil and gas, traditionally oil and gas company, that Shell has also made a commitment to become a net zero emissions company by 2050 or sooner in step with society. And since five years ago, we've started investing very heavily into our renewables and energy solutions business. So we, we are chipping in, we are playing our part and we are also very actively looking for collaboration. Um, so thank you for that. And if I could ask another one of our panelists to chip in, Aki, would mm -hmm. you share with us some collaboration examples? Yes, Emily. An uh, important role that the private sector uh, might uh, might be efficiency and uh, flexibility. And my experience of a collaboration that uh, worked well was an uh, energy conversion agreement. Like uh, uh, you just uh, uh, mentioned, everyone played its role, uh, collaboration of uh, risk sharing. Uh, uh, we had an energy conversion agreement that uh, we had with an off-taker, as the uh, off-taker was uh, able to bear the risk of uh, 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 fuel supply. Uh, we, the power generator, we were able to price our energy much uh, uh, more competitively uh, in that project. Uh, it was a project of uh, geothermal in uh, Costa Rica. Uh, the off-taker was a state-owned utility that uh, uh, they took the risk of uh, geothermal fluid supply uh, uh, in the uh, agreed 
uh, condition. Uh, and uh, uh, we, the private generator, deliver the power at the guaranteed efficiency and uh, uh, availability under the uh, uh, energy conversion agreement. So as we were both able to better manage the risk uh, through this collaboration, the project was uh, implemented much faster and uh, we were able to maximize the uh, economic competitiveness of the energy that uh, we could generate. Right, thank you for that. It's excellent example of collaboration. Hope we can replicate that. Let me go on to Chris. Could you share with us some examples as well? Yeah, um, I guess uh, collaboration is, is really the, the name of the game in uh, energy transition because there's a lot of uncertainties uh, unlike the more mature uh, uh, energy sources. Um, for us, uh, assets that we deliver uh, all over the world, be it you know, um, uh, wind turbine installation uh, vessel that we, we are going to deliver in the US, whether it is a substation, floating substation that is in Taiwan, or uh, whether it is a floating LNG plant that is going to uh, Senegal, Mauritania. I think all this itself needs collaboration all the way from government to financiers, to uh, equity holders, and even the yard, the construction. Because at the end of the day, uh, it is an end-to-end -end because it's a new source of energy. And that's not as matured as uh, what you have in a traditional upstream business. So um, collaboration about how to make that project real at the end of the day will take a lot of collaboration and brainstorming to make that real. Um, so we have uh, examples of that where we had to uh, enhance uh, some of the uh, credits on some of the project through whether it's from the government sector or whether it is from you know, the uh, project sponsors. Now, closer to home, um, as we move on with uh, energy transition, one question always comes to mind. Do you actually test out products, uh, prototyping first, or you wait for the market to actually allow it to be uh, uh, commercially viable before you start moving into the market. I think in Singapore, uh, we basically have this collaboration between, you know, um, Basti's, uh, or even EMA. We have projects with EMA, as I mentioned just now. Um, we are trying out energy storage within the yard, and later on, it can be marinized into uh, products that we can put on ships. Uh, or whether uh, we are in uh, collaboration, uh, partnership with Shell, Right, in the LNG uh, bunkering business in Singapore. Um, the maritime industry, because of IMO 2020, just shift to uh, a cleaner fuel uh, in order to meet the emission uh, standards. LNG is one of them, and Singapore being the port of call, will need us to actually collaborate um, with uh, traditional partners and also with uh, authorities like MPA to actually set out what are the regulation and standards first that you want to operate the business safely and then after that be able to propagate that and uh, make Singapore an attractive place to come that you can bunker efficiently. Right. So there are things like that that I think you need end-to-end um, -end supply chain collaboration at the end of the day for, to, to en enable the transition to happen. Right? Uh, because there's no um, traditional sources of credit you know, to, to make sure that it is a mature industry. Right. Thank you for that. Indeed, end-to-end -end collaboration is very, very key. From the regulators to the private sector players to technology providers, we need the end-to-end -end collaboration. So, Sushan, what is your reaction to, to such collaboration? How is the market reacting and what kind of financing will be available? So as the only banker on the, on the panel, I guess I'll talk about financial collaboration then. And, and I'll take a life cycle lens around this. Uh, you could start off with uh, new renewable energy technology. Before the sustainable, I guess the private sector will be the innovative brains behind these new uh, startups. Uh, and here the collaboration could be, be between the innovation of the startup community, uh, a government support, research grants, education institutions, etc. So you're seeing very active space here, right, in, in developed countries and also in places like Singapore. That's exciting and that's, you know, it's high risk. You also 
probably need some private equity participation there, uh, but hopefully high returns. So I see some partnerships happening in that ecosystem, the startup ecosystem. Then when, when a project becomes a little bit more commercially viable, as I said, I think the multilaterals should step up. They can and they will and they have been um, uh, before it becomes a, a, a more you know, sustainable or viable project. And at that point, uh, a, a private sector investors can come in, um, public sector investors can come in, funds can come in, the, the whole capital markets can come in. Um, I shared examples of sustainab sustainability bonds that can be used to finance these uh, transition projects. Um, and, and, and the innovation around this is show us, show us that you're putting your money where your mouth is, right? So if you can meet your sustainability milestones or your pivots, we'll give you a reward. We'll, we'll cut your cost of credit. If you can't, we will punish you and we will make you pay for it. Um, so I think that, that there are various kind of innovation and, 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 and collaboration around this sort of more mature ecosystems. Uh, so I, I, I see this partnership now also being extended from today's this morning session across countries, uh, across, um, you know, public, private sector. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of uh, forums like this uh, are precisely the kind of forums we need to bring these partners closer together. Uh, already, we've been talking about different kinds of uh, collaborations that will take away after SU, and I'm, I, I'm optimistic that, you know, we, we, we will, this will lead to more tangible results. Thank you for that. It's encouraging to see the innovation in all parties. Um, you mentioned a little bit about startups just now, so helping early stage startups. How do we help bring those technologies to market, right? What are your thoughts on how can we encourage and nurture more energy startups? Um, maybe I'll ask Chris first. Um, okay, uh, this is one part where I think um, as we approach the energy transition, I, I think that there will be a lot of uncharted waters out there. Uh, new products, um, it is Im almost impossible for one party to be able to bring and re-engineer uh, engineer everything ourselves. So uh, what we did is that we actually uh, participate or actively sought out uh, uh, the so-called Pier 71, that is an uh, innovative lab by right. MPA uh, in NUS, and also some of the SMEs that got good solutions. So our architecture and our backbone within our digitalization uh, framework is actually quite an open, open source, a modular source. So we encourage them to come in, plug in their solutions to solve pain points, and if it actually meets the requirement, we actually put it in our products uh, itself. Um, besides that, uh, with startups and also with um, uh, universities, right? Um, take for example, we have TCOMs in Singapore, and they have a way basin to test um, new products, that new assets they're going to put there. We're developing a digital twin with them to be able to, you know, uh, forecast um, issues structurally and also product-wise to be able to uh, apply that to the product without having to face it when the product is actually at work. So these are the few things that we are looking at uh, startups and also uh, technology providers right. to actually incorporate them and de-risk actually the product that we're going to put out there. Right. Thank you for that. I think similarly, Shell also has a collaboration with EMA that is um, on a Startup Engine, where we're helping to accelerate energy startups. And this is a space where we found in the early days when we started it, that there was very little support in the, in the industry, in the VC community on energy startups, because it was not so well understood. So we started this program to be able to harness more uh, support for the energy startups and to help them through that journey and bring them to commercial outcome. Maybe I'll also po uh, see if Suman, you want to add on how you work with universities or startups in India? Yeah, sure. So, you know, one of the issues that we find is that uh, there is relatively less understanding also in, in academia uh, for, uh, you know, the energy transition uh, and the scale of it. And the kinds of things that people were working on in academia, we found were not that, that directly relevant. And so we need to uh, channelize a little bit of academic research also because that's as you know an area from where a lot of startups can also emerge and so we've set up for example a center of uh, uh, excellence with the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi and uh, with the idea being to you know do research in a number of areas and work with the local incubator that they have there to see whether we can in fact accelerate the development of new technology companies in our space 
in addition to that, uh, of course, one can work directly with uh, new clean tech companies. Uh, you know, there has been a history of clean tech companies in the past, which unfortunately did not do very well. So a lot of clean tech investments in the earlier rounds, uh, those investments went uh, under. Uh, and now I think uh, is the right time though, because now the sector is really going to grow. It's a lot more sustainable, this growth, um, and much more visible. So I'm hopeful that a lot of new clean tech startups will emerge. We have certainly seen it happening in the area of digital. There's a lot more activity globally. We have seen that happening in the area of storage research. Um, lots of new uh, battery tech companies that are coming up. Uh, again, which of them survive, we don't know. So this is an area that does require very hardcore venture capital investing because we don't know which are going to be the companies that will be successful in the long run. Uh, and there will also be a lot of, I think, uh, uh, new companies arising in the area of uh, new business models around residential solar or residential uh, uh, power and as well as energy efficiency. So I think those kinds of areas and then electric mobility is another big area around charging stations and those kinds of things. So I think there are lots of new areas that are emerging and I think we'll see a, you know, much more VC money going in uh, into the clean tech space and also to create new companies because and, and sort of business model investing I think will also be there a lot more. Right. Thank you for that. So I think we've had a very engaging panel discussion. We've talked about new digital technologies coming out, so upcoming technologies that can really move the needle in accelerating energy transition. And beyond technologies, we talk about innovation in financing, we talk about innovation in business models, and also the participation required from government as well to help in terms of regulations and setting a level playing field. And then we talk about how do we help startups in this space to really accelerate technology innovation. And I think a very central theme to all of this is collaboration. Collaboration, 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 right? So I think unprecedented collaboration between the government, the private sector, and also the community will be really needed in order for us to really accelerate and advance the energy transition. So with that, I would like to thank my panelists for your participation. I really enjoyed the session, and I hope that the audience has enjoyed it as well. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for facilitating that session. Thank you very much.